Now, about the speaker, our speaker today is Dr. Darlene Opfer. Darlene is Vice President and Director of Rand Education and Labor and holds the Distinguished Chair in Education Policy at the Rand Corporation. Darlene and I first met at the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge, where she was Director of Research and Senior Lecturer in Research Methods and School Improvement from 2005 to 2011. Darlene Opfer has conducted policy research studies for a number of local, state, and national governments on issues that affect teachers and schools, including recruitment and retention, professional development, and the impact of policies on teacher practice. In 2014, she was selected as Thomas Alexander Fellow by the OECD, where she used TALIS 2013 data to explore conditions that support teacher professional development. Her research also includes national studies of teacher professional development for England and Turkey, a study of teacher professional development and its relationship to school outcomes in six US states, and a study of recruitment and retention of teachers and school leaders for the Scottish government. Darlene Opfer has served as advisor to various government offices responsible for education in different parts of the world, including in Israel and India. Darlene Opfer completed the Teaching and Learning International Survey, known as TALIS Video Study for the OECD. This afternoon, she will present the methodology and the findings from the TALIS Video Study of Teaching Practices. The study covered eight countries and economies, Chile, China, Colombia, Germany, Japan, Mexico, Spain, and the United Kingdom. Without further ado, I will now pass over to Darlene. The floor is yours. If you want to share your slides, please do so. Thank you. Yes, I will start sharing. Excellent. Oop, I need to go back though. Okay. Um, good afternoon, morning, everyone. Um, uh, as Maya said, uh, I led along with a number of other people the TALIS video study for the OECD, which is now, if you look uh, at the OECD page, it's called the Global Teaching Insight Study. <clears throat> um, to carry off a study like this requires a lot of help. Um, and so you see at the bottom, there are a number of organizations involved in what's called the International Consortium that designed the study in terms of methods and all of the instrumentation um, associated with it. So RAND, the organization that I work for, the Wisconsin Center for Education Research, um, DIPF in Germany, uh, which is the Institute, Institute for Research and information and education, and then ETS, the Education Testing Service, um, located in the US. So the study had um, a, number of, uh, a number of goals when we started um, that we kept in mind throughout. Uh, the first is to understand which aspects of teaching are related to student learning and other non-cognitive outcomes and the nature of those relationships. Uh, we also wanted to observe and document how teachers teach in different countries and contexts. Um, we also hope that as a result of this study, we're stimulating an increasingly nuanced discussion of teaching practices, especially their relationship with student outcomes, um, and that that conversation influences both educators, policymakers, researchers, and the general public. And finally, um, one of the goals of the study was to test the feasibility of observing teaching and learning in different countries using a common um, study procedure and protocol. So a couple of things about what sets the video study apart. Um, first, uh, it sort of rests on a, a, a fairly long line of large scale international research on teaching um, starting with work that was done by IEA, um, the TIMS study, uh, some of the other regional studies like the LISA Nordic study, the Pythagoras study that was done in Germany and Switzerland, 
um, some country-based studies like the Measures of Effective Teaching Study in the US. So uh, the study builds on this sort of long line of um, work around teaching and um, tries to address some of the issues that have been raised over time in do, trying to do these very large projects. So Maya um, said to you we had eight different, we call them jurisdictions, since we have cities as well as countries involved in the, in the study. Um, and they were really diverse set of countries. So in this presentation, um, I know the uh, title, which I gave long, long time ago, said I was gonna cover the methods and findings, and I am gonna cover the methods. I will talk a little bit about findings, but um, since we released the study, there are multiple um, video presentations that kind of dig into the findings. And so given um, this community who's interested in you know, international and comparative research, I thought I would also try in this and spend more of my time talking about the issues that this study faced methodologically and the way that those issues limit what we're able to say about this study. So first um, to know that this, the methods were longitudinal. Um, this is a big um, or large sort of step in terms of improvement on previous video studies like TEMS because we had both pre and post tests and pre and post surveys, both of students and teachers in this. Um, it also um, was looking at outcomes. So unlike many of the other studies in the past that used video for teaching, <clears throat> we are looking at the relationship between teaching and student outcomes, particularly um, student achievement, but also uh, motivation and other social and emotional outcomes uh, related. So on this, this slide, we try to sort of uh, summarize um, all the aspects, and there were many, um, of this study. So obviously teaching is the primary thing we want to understand and look at. We had five different measures of teaching um, involved in the study. So we had the videos and we, we developed um, a common uh, observational rubric for assessing or documenting, coding those teacher videos. We also collected artifacts. Um, and so again, common um, coding rubric was used across all the countries to um, look at the artifacts. We had, as I mentioned, you know, the, the pre and post tests, but we also in both the student questionnaire and the teacher questionnaire um, <clears throat> asked about teaching in those. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit later on, um, we had a teacher log. So each of the teachers um, for every day that they taught the, the subject um, filled out a log, uh, which talked about like what subjects they covered and how they covered them. So the video study has a tremendous amount of data. Uh, we have in terms of reporting and analyzing only scratched the surface. The data is available uh, for other researchers to be able to use. So you can get it by requesting it from the OECD. Um, and all of the files, so all the tests, all the surveys, the video codes, et cetera, are all available for all eight countries. <clears throat> so if you are interested in comparative work, uh, I would definitely suggest it as a resource. Um, and like I said, there are so many questions we have not even started to address um, for this study. Okay, so let me tell you what was collected. So we've got eight countries. Uh, in each of the eight countries, we wanted to film two classroom lessons per teacher, 85 different teachers per country. So in each country, they collected 170 approximately, give or take a few videos. <clears throat> we also, as I mentioned, collected instructional artifacts. These included teacher lesson plans, student work, student assignments, 
they were collected the day of the taped lesson, lesson and then the following day. So we ended up with four days of artifacts for each teacher um, in the study, as well as we collected the final unit assessment if there was one. And I mentioned we um, had both teacher and student pre and post questionnaires. For the most part, uh, we tried to adapt uh, questions from Talis and Pisa, although there were some things we had to um, change, particularly because we had a specific um, content focus, and I will talk about that in just a second. Um, but otherwise, we collected, as I mentioned, pre and post mathematics assessment scores. Um, we, I mentioned that ETS was involved. Uh, they worked, that team worked with the international consortium members um, to develop a test. And the pretest was a general math achievement test. Um, it covered prerequisites for quadratic equations and a small amount of focal content. The post-test covered quadratic equations. Um, we also then uh, collected demographic information from um, school, about the school, so the number of teachers, students, what setting it was in, and we collected information uh, about parent education from students, the languages spoken at home, and we used home possessions as a proxy for fam family wealth. Um, so quadratic equations. Why did we focus on quadratic equations? Well, first of all, we focus on math. And if you're familiar with a lot of the large scale international work, mathematics um, is often the, the subject of that work, um, primarily because there's more, the belief that there's more sort of consistency across countries in terms of what's taught um, than there are in other subjects like language arts or history or... Um, in the past studies, particularly looking at PISA and some of the other uh, large scale achievement related studies, um, it's become clear over time that a big uh, contribution to the differences in achievement between countries is something called OTL or opportunity to learn. So that's the idea that um, part of what's driving scores on PISA is that students aren't even taught the content. Um, so PISA covers a lot of content that is just not taught by that grade level in many countries. So when you look at the PISA rankings, for example, you sort of have to keep in mind like, is this really about what they were taught or is this um, an artifact of just not being exposed to it? So because that's become, um, we've become increasingly aware of that as an issue, we wanted to try to take opportunity to learn out of the sort of frame for this study. <clears throat> so we focused on quadratic equations. Now to get to that topic was quite, um, quite a process. So we had to map um, mathematics topics in all eight of the countries. We were looking at the ages between say 13 and 15 year olds. So we mapped them. All, all the content across all eight countries in that age band, trying to find topics that were commonly taught across all eight countries. Turns out there's only two. Completely stunned us. But there are only two common topics um, across those eight countries in that age, uh, that age span. One was linear, linear equations and the other was quadratic equations. We chose quadratic because we felt that there was more opportunity for variation in teaching than linear, teaching linear equations might uh, demonstrate. <clears throat> um, one of the things that you should know about these studies for OECD is that there's an international consortium that does all the design work and the analysis, but the actual study is carried out in each jurisdiction. So there are country level teams in all of the countries who um, do all of the data collection. So they recruit the schools and teachers, they field questionnaires and tests, they video recorded all the lessons and collected the artifacts, they rated all the videos uh, using our, the rubric that we had um, developed 
And then they keyed in, inputted all the testing questionnaire data into a big file, and then they ship it back to the international consortium. So the IC and the OECD has very little um, control um, sometimes over what happens in countries and how things get fielded. Um, this was a this study was a very large burden on teachers. So you think about they're being recorded twice, they're being uh, surveyed, tested twice, asked to you know keep their teaching materials together. Um, it it was a lot of work. Uh, some of the countries did better because they followed our guidance, which is you know don't hire somebody to collect this data. Like, don't just sort of assume that teachers in the midst of all their teaching and trying to participate in the study will be able to handle this themselves. Um, some countries uh, didn't do that. They relied on teachers um, to essentially collect the data from themselves and then ship it to the country level. And that created a lot of problems, some of which I will talk about in a minute. Um, so again, when you look at the results from uh, these large scale studies, it's really important to read the technical, um, uh, technical, technical report that goes with it because it's there, it's not in the final report about the findings, but it's in the technical, like what all the deviations are from the methods that were originally laid out. So then you can get a sort of understanding about like what you might be saying. Okay, so I mentioned that um, 85 schools, 85 teachers in 85 schools, <clears throat> we gave each of the countries um, sampling lists uh, for the country. Um, Stats Canada uh, is the sort of uh, sampling people of record for the OECD. So they do all the sampling for PISA, TALIS, and the video study. Um, one of the weird or interesting things about the video study is that it was going on at the same time TALIS was, and we couldn't have any overlap in samples between the survey, TALIS itself, and the video study. So it just made sampling really difficult to not have that kind of overlap, but get a big enough sampling frame that people, that the countries could actually like get the number of teachers that they needed to. But the idea with the sampling um, plan was we wanted to see as much variation as possible so that we could really sort of try to look at um, achievement. But it's also important to know the samples in the video study are not nationally representative. Um, and in fact, in some cases they are, um, they are uh, very narrowed down to particular states or regions in the country. For the analysis, um, the primary analysis for the study, we fit hierarchical linear models within each country. We use student achievement, interest, or self-efficacy, -eff sorry, uh, as the dependent variable. The teaching me the measures were the independent variables, and we had control variables that included the pretest uh, test scores, gender, migrant status, home positions, home possessions, class averages for all of those, and then a total class size control um, design. So what we were doing, because the analysis is all based in the country, is a replicated case study design. It is not, in fact, a comparative study, um, and I'll get to why uh, in just a few minutes, but um, yes, the, the analysis is by country um, intentionally. Okay, so to the uh, major sort of discussion I want to have is about the issues um, that this study faced. Um, and that frankly, most large scale international studies face, whether they talk about it or not. Some of it is kind of like the dirty little secret of these studies, um, which you'll see in a minute. But um, I mentioned sampling was really difficult because this was a high burden on teachers. Um, you know, what we wanted them to do is take our sampling frame, select a school, 
contact the school, get their approval, then sample from the teachers in the school, get the, the teacher to approve. And if they couldn't do that, then they should go on to the next school in the sampling frame. Some countries did that. Uh, Chile did that very well. Um, England did it for the most part. Um, Japan uh, focused on particular cities instead of doing a, a national thing. But in fact, what ended up happening is there are a number of countries who didn't follow the sampling plan because they started to follow it and realized we're never going to get to 85 teachers. Um, recruitment for the study took 18 months just to get the 85 teachers. And at some point, um, many of the countries just abandoned um, this sort of one by one by one kind of sampling procedure. And they would contact like a whole set like 10 schools at a time, and whoever responded first, they'd take, or second, they'd take. Um, so uh, it is not, in fact, um, it, it's more convenience in, in a number of the countries than it is um, a random sample of teachers. Um, I specifically call out Madrid, uh, Madrid here uh, because they were one of the countries that used teachers to collect their data. And as we started analyzing their data, we realized there was something really wacky going on. So for example, you'd find um, post-test scores that were lower than the pre-test scores. Or we'd find on the student questionnaires that the student said in their pre-questionnaire one thing, and then in the post-questionnaire, like the completely opposite thing. Um, well, when we dug into it, we realized that Madrid, having the teachers collect the data in Madrid, they did not follow the ID process that we had laid out for them. So the idea was that every student in, a, in the teacher, focal teacher's class and every teacher <clears throat> had a unique ID. It was assigned to them at the beginning of the study so that all of the um, instruments that we were collecting could all be matched. Well, in Madrid, what happened is it looks like they like randomly gave out pre and post tests and then randomly gave out uh, the other end, the post test um, assessment and surveys. And so they were not linking the IDs for teachers and students. So in a lot of the analysis, if you take a look at the um, reporting, um, the report in OECD or any of the public webinars that we've done, which are off the OECD uh, website videos, um, you'll see that we don't talk about Madrid because it's their data just did not allow us to do a really good analysis given that they weren't tied together. Okay, um, the biggest issue that large scale international studies have is a problem called measurement variance. You probably have heard about this, but there are three levels of measurement uh, variance. One is called configurational. Um, sometimes it's referred to as dimensional or same form. Uh, and essentially, when you get to configural invariance, it means that there are, num there are an equal number of factors that emerge in every country. So you take a, a scale, um, <clears throat> you run a factor analysis on it, and you get four factors in England, you should also get four in Germany, four in Japan, et cetera. Metric invariance is when the strength of the relationship between the latent variables and the observed variables is the same across every country. And then the strongest, often called scalar uh, measurement variance is when the observed scores are regressed on each factor and the intercepts are equal across the group. Um, so it's a very high level of uh, a very high bar uh, to be able to meet in terms of variance. So I'm putting up this graph or this table, which comes from um, the technical report in chapter 18, which shows our analysis for invariance. And so you see we ran models for configural metric and scalar invariance. And then the, the final column tells what level we achieved in this study. 
So you see that for the most part, we reached a uh, metric. Um, in, in student discourse, um, that scale only reached configural when we had all eight um, countries or jurisdictions involved. Um, Chile and Mexico were, had very odd or unusual um, results. So we ran it again and took Chile and Mexico and out and then we got to metric. But it's important to know that if you get to metric, which is where most international studies get to, they don't get to, get to um, the strong scalar invariance, you cannot or should not uh, compare means because it means that the mean in each country doesn't mean the same thing. So as an example, if you have a four point scale and China, you know, China's average is a three, um, England's average is also a three, but what that three means is different between those two countries. It is not the same. Um, and so this is a big mistake that lots of international um, studies make in that they don't deal with measurement variance. And as a result, you see things like this, um, where you see countries laid out and they're giving you the mean uh, with the air ban. Um, and it's asking you to compare the countries on the mean. This is bad. <laughs> this is something that, that shouldn't be done because um, as I said, uh, it does not mean the same thing across those countries. Instead, Here's what we did. Um, we looked at the relationship between achievement and student motivation. That's what this, um, this graph is showing you. Um, so we're taking all the scores on achievement and motivation, looking at their association, and then using regression to identify what the slope and direction is within that country. So you see here that there's a set of countries like Japan, um, Shanghai, uh, who's the green one, England, and Chile, who have a positive relationship between um, student motivation and uh, outcomes, achievement. But the other countries going the other way on this axis have a negative relationship between those. If you had just looked at the mean on this, you wouldn't understand that. Um, you wouldn't know the direction um, of the relationship. So this is, in terms of best practice in large-scale international studies, this is what we would expect to see instead of the, that previous slide. Um, and, and here's another reason why this is important. Um, when we looked at the relationship between teaching and motivation, it had a, a very different outcomes by country. So for Shanghai, there was a very strong relationship between the quality of instruction and student motivation. In Chile, Colombia, and England, the, the strongest relationship was between social emotional support and motivation. And in Germany, there was also a relationship between instruction quality of instruction and student motivation, but it was negative. So for example, like in Shanghai, what you have is that the better the instructional level, which is kind of code for high cognitive engagement, the more cognitive engagement you have in Shanghai, the more motivated their students are in mathematics. But in Germany, the larger the cognitive engagement is in mathematics, the lower the motivation is for mathematics. Very different um, outcome, which would be completely masked if you started looking only at means instead of relationships. Okay, another problem um, that these studies have is around translation. And this is something that is also not often talked about. First of all, there are some ideas and concepts that are just untranslatable. Uh, I'll show you some examples in just a few minutes. Um, you'll often see in country uh, in studies that involve multiple countries that they do some process of back translation. 
that's actually inefficient. It does not get you to language equivalents across countries. So in the OECD studies, like the video study, like TALIS, like PISA, there's a very elaborate translation process. Um, the first is the countries take the questionnaires as an example, and the international consortium will identify things that can be adapted. And those things are really straightforward, grade level. So if you have a, you know, a, a question that asks you know, in third grade or in 11th grade, they can make the grade, change the grade level to the appropriate level. Another one that's often changes currency in questions. So pound, euro, dollar, whatever. Um, those are easy changes. Okay, so they submit to the international consortium all the adaptations they wanna make to the questions and we approve them saying, yes, that's, a, that's an adaptation you're allowed to make. So then we send it back to them with the questions and their adaptations, and then it goes through a translation process. In each country, two independent translators translate the instruments. They then come together, they compare their translations and they mediate the translations until they come up with an agreed version. That then comes back to the International Consortium and we have another translator compare the country made translation to the, quest, the questions or the items in English. Um, then, you know, once we have an agreed translated uh, copy, it goes back to the countries, they do the formatting, et cetera, to be able to administer it. Very elaborate process. And I can tell you, we know that even with this process, uh, there were some translations that are now incorrect. Um, when we started looking at specific items between um, say Shanghai and Germany, as an example, uh, the, some of the responses and the directions of the response didn't make sense. So we brought the Chinese um, and the German team together to talk about it and realize that the Chinese translation was not correct, that it uh, was slightly different and that caused differences in response. So once we have the translated um, items, uh, we ran a pilot test to assess the function of each item in all of the instruments. We looked at the alpha for internal consistency, so how closely related a set of items are as a group. We did item test correlation, so how associated is each item with the scale overall, and then conformatory factor analysis, so how coherent and structured um, is the scale that we're looking at. So I'm going to show you um, an untranslatable scale. So in this scale, we were looking at um, personal attitudes um, and we wanted to understand the relationship between personal attitudes to mathematics, motivation and achievement. This is a commonly used scale in the US. We did all the translation. We ran all the, um, the statistics to look at item functioning. And what we got in the first round was that the alpha is only 0.56. Um, we decided we needed to drop a bunch of items. Our goal was to keep four and then drop the rest. So we go through a, an analysis iteration where we're essentially like deleting each item and seeing how it affects um, the overall alpha. And so you see this, we, you know, we deleted A, then we deleted C, we deleted B, trying to run it to get to a high enough scale alpha for a scale. And the result of our analysis is no scale appeared. We could not get it above uh, 0 0.59, 0 0.56, which is unacceptable. Um, so we ended up having to drop all those items. We don't have anything related to sort of personal um, orientation. In this other example, we were trying to get at belief. There's Sorry, some literature. Mean. Okay. Sorry, can yep. we finish in about like two, three minutes if that's possible? Okay, yep, I'll skip this example then um, and go on to the last thing, which is reporting bias. We know it exists. Um, it exists at two levels, country level and personal level. I, I'm showing you Malaysia. Malaysia wasn't part of our study, but Malaysia is a very happy 
country. And so when you ask their teachers anything, they're like super happy, way happier than any other country. And so you, when you look at Malaysia's results, you have to sort of keep that in mind that some of what you're seeing is a, a cultural artifact. Teacher level, same thing. Uh, we've run some experiments in the US trying to correct for teacher specific bias by, we did a, this is an example where we showed, we asked them to answer questions. We showed them a video of a teacher doing what we wanted, you know, what this practice was. We asked them again. When they answered again the second time, you see the results come down significantly. Um, so teacher bias is a big thing. We tried to eliminate some of this by using the teacher log. Uh, so the research shows that if you ask teachers like every day, they, there's less bias in their reporting. So you see lots of different problems that have to be considered when you're looking at the results of a study like this. So now I'll turn it back to you, Maya. Thank you so much. Excellent, very detailed and uh, really important insights to look at the challenges that you face. As you mentioned at the start, not everyone really um, talks about the challenges when we look at international or comparative or international and comparative studies. Um, so this is quite, in, this provides a lot of insights to us who are undertaking such studies, much smaller scale, many of us, obviously. Um, so I see already questions coming in. Um, can I start by one question, perhaps, because uh, some of the attendees may not be very familiar with this study and they may want to know um, what were maybe some of the very key findings of this study, just perhaps very briefly to summarize, and then I will go and start inviting uh, sure. participants. Um, one is that the relationship between different teaching practices and our, the outcomes we were looking at varies between every country. So this notion that we have some kind of universal pra teaching practice that always works, no. Every single country had different um, associations. The other thing that was really interesting is that um, uh, there's a lot of improvement. Like even in high achieving, a lot of room for improvement, even in high achieving places like Shanghai in Japan on mathematics, uh, they, their teachers did not you know, teach outstandingly. Um, so there's a lot of improvement everywhere for teaching. And then, um, yeah. Oh, finally, I would say on the, the, one of the things from the teaching log we learned is that how quadratic equations are taught in every country vary significantly. There are some countries that never graph. They only teach the function. They don't use any representational um, approaches, et cetera. So 